A Story of the Stone Age by H. G. Wells Narrated by Peter Walters Chapter 1 Uglomi and Ouya This story is of a time beyond the memory of man, before the beginning of history, a time when one might have walked dry-shod from France, as we call it now, to England, and when a broad and sluggish Thames flowed through its marshes to meet its father Rhine, flowing through a wide and level country that is under water in these latter days, and which we know by the name of the North Sea. In that remote age, the valley which runs along the foot of the downs did not exist, and the south of Surrey was a range of hills, fur-clad on the middle slopes and snow-capped for the better part of the year. The cores of its summits still remain as Leith Hill and Pitch Hill and Hindhead. On the lower slopes of the range, below the grassy spaces where the wild horses grazed, were forests of yew and sweet chestnut and elm, and the thickets and dark places hid the grizzly bear and the hyena and the grey apes clambered through the branches. And still lower, amidst the woodland and marsh and open grass along the way, did this little drama play itself out, to the end that I have to tell. Fifty thousand years ago it was, fifty thousand years, if the reckoning of geologists is correct. And in those days the springtime was as joyful as it is now, and sent the blood coursing in just the same fashion. The afternoon sky was blue with piled white clouds sailing through it, and the southwest wind came like a soft caress. The newcomer swallows drove to and fro. The reaches of the river were spangled with white ranunculus. The marshy places were starred with ladies' smock and lit with marshmallow wherever the regiments of the sedges lowered their swords, and the northward-moving hippopotami, shiny black monsters sporting clumsily, came floundering and blundering through it all rejoicing dimly and possessed with one clear idea, to splash the river muddy. Up the river, and well in sight of the hippopotami, a number of little buff-coloured animals dabbled in the water. There was no fear, no rivalry, and no enmity between them and the hippopotami. As the great bulks came crashing through the reeds and smashed the mirror of the water into silvery splashes, these little creatures shouted and gesticulated with glee. It was the surest sign of high spring. Bolu! they cried. Beya! Bolu! They were the children of the menfolk the smoke of whose encampment rose from the knoll at the river's bend. Wild-eyed youngsters they were, with matted hair and little broad-nosed impish faces, covered, as some children are covered even nowadays, with a delicate down of hair. They were narrow in the loins and long in the arms, and their ears had no lobes, and had little pointed tips a thing that still, in rare instances, survives. Stark naked, vivid little gypsies, as active as monkeys and as full of chatter, though a little wanting in words. Their elders were hidden from the wallowing hippopotami by the crest of a knoll. The human squatting place was a trampled area among the dead brown fronds of royal fern through which the croziers of this year's growth were unrolling to the light and warmth. The fire was a smouldering heap of char, light grey and black, replenished by the old women from time to time, with brown leaves. Most of the men were asleep. They slept sitting with their foreheads on their knees. They had killed that morning a good quarry, enough for all a deer that had been wounded by hunting dogs, 
so that there had been no quarrelling among them, and some of the women were still gnawing the bones that lie scattered about. Others were making a heap of leaves and sticks to feed Brother Fire when the darkness came again, that he might grow strong and tall therewith and guard them against the beasts. And two were piling flints that they had brought, an armful at a time, from the bend of the river where the children were at play. None of these buff-skinned savages were clothed, but some wore about their hips rude girdles of adder skin, or crackling, undressed hide, from which depended little bags, not made, but torn from the paws of beasts, and carrying the rudely dressed flints that were men's chief weapons and tools. And one woman, the mate of Ouya, the cunning man, wore a wonderful necklace of perforated fossils that others had worn before her. Beside some of the sleeping men lay the big antlers of the elk, with the tines chipped to sharp edges, and long sticks hacked at the ends with flint into sharp points. There was little else save these things and the smouldering fire to mark these human beings off from the wild animals that ranged the country. But Ouya, the cunning, did not sleep but sat with a bone in his hand and scraped busily thereon with a flint, a thing no animal would do. He was the oldest man in the tribe, beetle-browed, prognathous, lank-armed, he had a beard, and his cheeks were hairy, and his chest and arms were black with thick hair, and by virtue both of his strength and cunning he was master of the tribe and his share was always the most and the best. Eudina had hidden herself amongst the alders, because she was afraid of Ouya. She was still a girl, and her eyes were bright, and her smile pleasant to see. He had given her a piece of the liver, a man's piece, and a wonderful treat for a girl to get. But as she took it, the other woman with the necklace had looked at her, an evil glance, and Uglomi had made a noise in his throat. At that, Ouya had looked at him long and steadfastly, and Uglomi's face had fallen, and then Ouya had looked at her. She was frightened and had stolen away while the feeding was still going on, and Ouya was busy with the marrow of a bone. Afterwards he had wandered about as if looking for her, and now she crouched among the elders, wondering mightily what Ouya might be doing with the flint and the bone. And Uglomi was not to be seen. Presently a squirrel came leaping through the elders, and she lay so quiet the little man was within six feet of her before he saw her whereupon he dashed up a stem in a hurry and began to chatter and scold her. "'What are you doing here?' he asked, "'away from the other men-beasts.' "'Peace,' said Eudina. But he only chattered more, and then she began to break off the little black cones to throw at him. He dodged and defied her, and she grew excited and rose up to throw better, and then she saw Ouya coming down the knoll. He had seen the movement of her pale arm amidst the thicket. He was very keen-eyed. At that she forgot the squirrel and set off through the alders and reeds as fast as she could go. She did not care where she went, so long as she escaped Ouya. She splashed nearly knee-deep through a swampy place and saw in front of her a slope of ferns growing more slender and green as they passed up out of the light into the shade of the young chestnuts. She was soon amidst the trees. She was very fleet of foot, and she ran on and on until the forest was old and the vales great, and the vines about their stems, where the light came, were thick as young trees, and the ropes of ivy stout and tight. On she went, 
She doubled and doubled again, and then at last lay down amid some ferns, in a hollow place near a thicket, and listened with her heart beating in her ears. She heard footsteps presently, rustling among the dead leaves, far off, and they died away and everything was still again, except the scandalising of the midges, for the evening was drawing on, and the incessant whisper of the leaves, she laughed silently to think the cunning Ouya should go by her. She was not frightened. Sometimes, playing with the other girls and lads, she had fled into the wood, though never so far as this. It was pleasant to be hidden and alone. She lay a long time there, glad of her escape, and then she sat up, listening. It was a rapid pattering, growing louder and coming towards her, and in a little while she could hear grunting noises and the snapping of twigs. It was a drove of lean, grisly wild swine. She turned about her, for a boar is an ill fellow to pass too closely, on account of the sideways slash of his tusks, and she made off, slantingly through the trees, but the patter came nearer. They were not feeding as they wandered, but going fast, or else they would not overtake her. And she caught the limb of a tree, swung on to it, and ran up the stem with something of the agility of a monkey. Down below, the sharp, bristling backs of the swine were already passing when she looked, and she knew the short, sharp grunts they made meant fear. What were they afraid of? A man? They were in a great hurry for just a man. And then, so suddenly it made her grip on the branch tighten involuntarily, a fawn started in the break and rushed after the swine. Something else went by, low and grey, with a long body. She did not know what it was. Indeed, she saw it only momentarily, through the interstices of the young leaves. And then, there came a pause. She remained stiff and expectant, as rigid almost as though she were part of the tree she clung to, peering down. Then, far away among the trees, clear for a moment, then hidden, then visible knee-deep in ferns, then gone again, ran a man. She knew it was young Uglomi by the fair colour of his hair, and there was red upon his face. Somehow his frantic flight and that scarlet mark made her feel sick. And then nearer, running heavily and breathing hard, came another man. At first she could not see, and then she saw, for shortened and clear to her, Ouya running with great strides and his eyes staring. He was not going after Uglomi. His face was white. It was Ouya, afraid? He passed and was still loud hearing when something else, something large and with grizzled fur, swinging along with soft, swift strides, came rushing in pursuit of him. Udina suddenly became rigid, ceased to breathe, her clutch convulsive and her eyes starting. She had never seen the thing before. She did not even see him clearly now, but she knew at once it was the terror of the woodshade. His name was a legend. The children would frighten one another, frighten even themselves with his name, and run screaming to the squatting place. No man had ever killed any of his kind. Even the mighty mammoth feared his anger. It was the grisly bear, the lord of the world as the world went then. As he ran, he made a continuous growling grumble. Men in my very lair, fighting and blood. At the very mouth of my lair, men, 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 fighting and blood. For he was the lord of the wood and the caves. Long after he had passed, she remained, 
a girl of stone staring down through the branches. All her power of action had gone from her. She gripped by instinct with hands and knees and feet. It was some time before she could think, and then only one thing was clear in her mind, that the terror was between her and the tribe, that it would be impossible to descend. Presently, when her fear was a little abated, she clambered into a more comfortable position where a great branch fought. The trees rose about her so that she could see nothing of Brother Fire, who is black by day. Birds began to stir, and things that had gone into hiding for fear of her movements crept out. After a time, the taller branches flamed out at the touch of the sunset. High overhead, the rooks, who were wiser than men, went cawing home to their squatting places among the elms. Looking down, things were clearer and darker. Eudina thought of going back to the squatting place. She let herself down some way, and then the fear of the terror of the woodshade came again. While she hesitated, a rabbit squealed dismally, and she dared not descend farther. The shadows gathered, and the deeps of the forest began stirring. Eudina went up the tree again to be nearer the light. Down below, the shadows came out of their hiding places and walked abroad. Overhead, the blue deepened. A dreadful stillness came, and then the leaves began whispering. Eudina shivered and thought of Brother Fire. The shadows now were gathering in the trees. They sat on the branches and watched her. Branches and leaves were turned to ominous, quiet black shapes that would spring on her if she stirred. Then the white owl, flitting silently, came ghostly through the shades. Darker grew the world, and darker, until the leaves and twigs against the sky were black and the ground was hidden. She remained there all night, an age-long vigil, straining her ears for things that went on below, in the darkness, and keeping motionless lest some stealthy beast should discover her. Man in those days was never alone in the dark save for such rare accidents as this. Age after age he had learnt the lesson of his terror, a lesson we poor children of his have nowadays painfully to unlearn. Eudina, though in age a woman, was in heart like a little child. She kept as still, poor little animal, as a hare before it is started. The stars gathered and watched her. Her one grain of comfort. In one bright one she fancied there was something like Uglomi. Then she fancied it was Uglomi, and near him... Red and duller was Ouya, and as the night passed, Uglomi fled before him, up the sky. She tried to see Brother Fire, who guarded the squatting place from beasts, but he was not in sight, and far away she heard the mammoths trumpeting as they went down to the drinking place, and once some huge bulk with heavy paces hurried along, making a noise like a calf but what it was she could not see. But she thought from the voice it was Yah, the rhinoceros, who stabs with his nose, goes always alone and rages without cause. At last the little stars began to hide, and then the larger ones. It was like all the animals vanishing before the terror. The sun was coming, lord of the sky, as the grizzly was lord of the forest. Eudina wondered what would happen if one star stayed behind, and then the sky paled to the dawn. When the daylight came, the fear of lurking things passed, and she could descend. She was stiff, but not so stiff as you would have been, dear young lady, by virtue of your upbringing. 
and as she had not been trained to eat at least once in three hours, but instead had often fasted three days, she did not feel uncomfortably hungry. She crept down the tree very cautiously and went her way stealthily through the wood, and not a squirrel sprang or deer started, but the terror of the grizzly bear froze her marrow. Her desire was now to find her people again. Her dread of Ouya, the cunning, was consumed by a greater dread of loneliness, but she had lost her direction. She had run heedlessly overnight, and she could not tell whether the squatting place was sunward or where it lay. Ever and again she stopped and listened, and at last very far away she heard a measured clinking. It was so faint, even in the morning stillness, that she could tell it must be far away, but she knew the sound was that of a man sharpening a flint. Presently the trees began to thin out, and then came a regiment of nettles, barring the way. She turned aside, and then she came to a fallen tree that she knew, with a noise of bees about it, and so presently she was in sight of the knoll, very far off, and the river under it, and the children and the hippopotami, just as they had been yesterday, and the thin spire of smoke swaying in the morning breeze. Far away by the river was the cluster of alders where she had hidden, and at the sight of that the fear of Ouya returned, and she crept into a thicket of bracken, out of which a rabbit scuttled, and lay a while to watch the squatting place. The men were mostly out of sight, saving Wow, the flint chopper, and at that she felt safer. They were away hunting food, no doubt. Some of the women, too, were down at the stream, stooping intent, seeking mussels, crayfish and water snails, and at the sight of their occupation Eudina felt hungry. She rose and ran through the fern, designing to join them. As she went she heard a voice among the bracken calling softly. She stopped. Then suddenly she heard a rustle behind her, and turning saw Uglomi rising out of the fern. There were streaks of brown blood and dirt on his face, and his eyes were fierce, and the white stone of Ouya, the white firestone that none but Ouya dared to touch, was in his hand. In a stride he was beside her, and gripped her arm. He swung her about, and thrust her before him towards the woods. Ouya, he said, and waved his arms about. She heard a cry, looked back, and saw all the women standing up, and two wading out of the stream. Then came a nearer howling, and the old woman with the beard, who watched the fire on the knoll, was waving her arms, and Wow, the man who had been chipping the flint, was getting to his feet. The little children, too, were hurrying and shouting. Come, said Uglomi, and dragged her by the arm. She still did not understand. Ouya has called the death word, said Uglomi, and she glanced back at the screaming curve of figures, and understood. Wow! and all the women and children were coming towards them, a scattered array of buff, shock-headed figures, howling, leaping, and crying. Over the knoll two youths hurried. Down among the ferns to the right came a man heading them off from the wood. Uglomi left her arm, and the two began running side by side, leaping the bracken and stepping clear and wide. Eudina, knowing her fleetness and the fleetness of Uglomi, laughed aloud at the unequal chase. They were an exceptionally straight-limbed couple for those days. They soon cleared the open and drew near the wood of chestnut trees again. Neither afraid now, because neither was alone. They slackened their pace, already not excessive, and suddenly Eudina cried and swerved aside, pointing and looking up through the tree stems. 
Uglomi saw the feet and legs of men running towards him. Udina was already running off at a tangent, and as he too turned to follow her, they heard the voice of Uya coming through the trees and roaring out his rage at them. Then terror came in their hearts, not the terror that numbs, but the terror that makes one silent and swift. They were cut off now on two sides. They were in a sort of corner of pursuit. On the right hand, and near by them, came the men swift and heavy, with bearded Uya, antler in hand, leading them. And on the left, scattered as one scatters corn, yellow dashes among the fern and grass, ran wow and the woman. And even the little children from the shallow had joined the chase. The two parties converged upon them. Off they went, with Udina ahead. They knew there was no mercy for them. There was no hunting so sweet to these ancient men as the hunting of men. Once the fierce passion of the chase was lit, the feeble beginnings of humanity in them were thrown to the winds. And Uya, in the night, had marked Uglomi with the death word. Uglomi was the day's quarry, the appointed feast. They ran straight. It was their only chance, taking whatever ground came in the way. A spread of stinging nettles, an open glade, a clump of grass, out of which a hyena fled, snarling. Then woods again, long stretches of shady leaf mould and moss under the green trunks. Then a stiff slope, tree-clad, and long vistas of trees. A glade, a succulent green area of black mud, a wide open space again, and then a clump of lacerating brambles, with beast tracks through it. Behind them the chase trailed out, and scattered, with Uya ever at their heels. Udina kept first place, running light and with her breath easy, for Uglomi carried the firestone in his hand. It told on his pace, not at first, but after a time. His footsteps behind her suddenly grew remote. Glancing over her shoulder as they crossed another open space, Udina saw that Uglomi was many yards behind her, and Uya close upon him, with Antler already raised in the air to strike him down. Wow and the others were but just emerging from the shadows of the woods. Seeing Uglomi in peril, Udina ran sideways, looking back, threw up her arms and cried aloud, just as the antler flew. And young Uglomi, expecting this and understanding her cry, ducked his head so that the missile merely struck his scalp, lightly, making but a trivial wound, and flew over him. He turned forthwith, the quartzite firestone in both hands, and hurled it straight at Uya's body as he ran loose from the throw. Uya shouted, but could not dodge it. It took him under the ribs, heavy and flat, and he wheeled and went down without a cry. Uglomi caught up the antler. One tine of it was tipped with his own blood and came running on again with a red trickle just coming out of his hair. Uya rolled over twice and lay a moment before he got up, and then he did not run fast. The colour of his face was changed. Wow overtook him and then others, and he coughed and laboured in his breath. But he kept on. Chapter 2 The Cave Bear in the days when Udina and Uglomi fled from the people of Uya towards the fur-clad mountains of the Weald, across the forests of Sweet Chestnut and the grass-clad Chalkland, and hid themselves at last in the gorge of the river between the chalk cliffs, men were few and their squatting places far between. The nearest men to them were those of the tribe, a full day's journey down the river, and up the mountains there were none. 
Man was indeed a newcomer to this part of the world in that ancient time. Coming slowly along the rivers, generation after generation, from one squatting place to another, from the south westward. And the animals that held the land, the hippopotamus and the rhinoceros of the river valleys, the horses of the grass plains, the deer and swine of the woods, the grey apes in the branches, the cattle of the uplands, feared him but little, let alone the mammoths in the mountains and the elephants that came through the land in the summertime, out of the south, for why should they fear him? With but the rough, chipped flints that he had not learnt to haft, and which he threw but ill, and the poor spear of sharpened wood, as all the weapons he had against hoof and horn, tooth and claw. Andu, the huge cave bear, who lived in the cave up the gorge, had never even seen a man in all his wise and respectable life, until midway through one night, as he was prowling down the gorge along the cliff edge, he saw the glare of Udina's fire upon the ledge, and Udina, red and shining, and Uglomi, with a gigantic shadow mocking him upon the white cliff, going to and fro, shaking his mane of hair and waving the axe of stone, the first axe of stone while he chanted of the killing of Ouya. The cave bear was far up the gorge, and he saw the thing slanting ways and far off. He was so surprised he stood quite still upon the edge, sniffing the novel odour of burning bracken, and wondering whether the dawn was coming up in the wrong place. He was the lord of the rocks and the caves, was the cave bear, as his slighter brother, the grizzly, was lord of the thick woods below, and as the dappled lion, the lion of those days was dappled, was lord of the thorn thickets, reed beds, and open plains. He was the greatest of all meat-eaters. He knew no fear. None preyed on him, and none gave him battle. Only the rhinoceros was beyond his strength. Even the mammoth shunned his country. This invasion perplexed him. He noticed these new beasts were shaped like the monkeys, and sparsely hairy like young pigs. Monkey and young pig, said the cave bear. It might not be so bad. But that red thing that jumps, and the black thing jumping with it yonder, Never in my life have I seen such things before. He came slowly along the brow of the cliff towards them, stopping thrice to sniff and peer, and the reek of the fire grew stronger. A couple of hyenas also were so intent upon the thing below that Andu, coming soft and easy, was close upon them before they knew of him, or he of them. They started guiltily and went lurching off. Coming round in a wheel a hundred yards off, they began yelling and calling him names to revenge themselves for the start they had had. Yaha! they cried. Who can't grub his own burrow? Who eats roots like a pig? Yaha! For even in those days, the hyena's manners were just as offensive as they are now. Who answers the hyena? growled Andu, peering through the midnight dimness at them, and then going to look at the cliff edge. And there was Uglomi, still telling his story, and the fire getting low, and the scent of the burning hot and strong. Andu stood on the edge of the chalk cliff for some time, shifting his vast weight from foot to foot, and swaying his head to and fro, with his mouth open, his ears erect and twitching, and the nostrils of his big black muzzle sniffing. He was very cautious, was the cave bear, more curious than any of the bears that live now, and the flickering fire and the incomprehensible movements of the man, let alone the intrusion into his indisputable province, 
stirred him with a sense of strange new happenings. He had been after red deer fawn that night, for the cave bear was a miscellaneous hunter, but this quite turned him from that enterprise. Yaha! yelled the hyenas behind. Yaha! Aha! Peering through the starlight, Andu saw there were now three or four going to and fro against the grey hillside. They will hang about me now all the night, until I kill, said Andu. Filth of the world! And mainly to annoy them, he resolved to watch the red flicker in the gorge until the dawn came, to drive the hyena scum home. And after a time they vanished, and he heard their voices like a party of cockney bean feasters away in the beech woods. Then they came slinking near again. Andu yawned and went along the cliff, and they followed. Then he stopped and went back. It was a splendid night, beset with shining constellations, the same stars, but not the same constellations we know, for since those days all the stars have had time to move into new places. Far away across the open space, beyond where the heavy-shouldered, lean-bodied hyenas blundered and howled, was a beechwood, and the mountain slopes rose beyond, a dim mystery, until their snow-capped summits came out white and cold and clear, touched by the first rays of the yet-unseen moon. It was a vast silence, save when the yell of the hyenas flung a vanishing discordance across its peace, or when from down the hills the trumpeting of the new-come elephants came faintly on the faint breeze. And below now, the red flicker had dwindled and was steady, and shone a deeper red, and Uglomi had finished his story, and was preparing to sleep. And Udina sat and listened to the strange voices of the unknown beasts, and watched the dark eastern sky growing deeply luminous at the advent of the moon. Down below, the river talked to itself, and things unseen went to and fro. After a time, the bear went away, but in an hour he was back again. Then, as if struck by a thought, he turned and went up the gorge. The night passed and Uglomi slept on. The waning moon rose and lit the gaunt white cliff overhead with a light that was pale and vague. The gorge remained in a deeper shadow, and seemed all the darker. Then, by imperceptible degrees, the day came stealing in the wake of the moonlight. Eudena's eyes wandered to the cliff brow overhead once, and then again. Each time the line was sharp and clear against the sky, and yet she had a dim perception of something lurking there. The red of the fire grew deeper and deeper, Grey scales spread upon it, its vertical column of smoke became more and more visible, and up and down the gorge things that had been unseen grew clear in a colourless illumination. She may have dozed. Suddenly she started up from her squatting position, erect and alert, scrutinising the cliff up and down. She made the faintest sound, and Uglomi too, Light sleeping like an animal, was instantly awake. He caught up his axe and came noiselessly to her side. The light was still dim, the world now all in black and dark grey, and one sickly star still lingered overhead. The ledge they were on was a little grassy space, six feet wide perhaps, and twenty feet long, sloping outwardly, and with a handful of St. John's wort growing near the edge. Below it, the soft white rock fell away in a steep slope of nearly fifty feet to the thick bush of hazel that fringed the river. Down the river, this slope increased, 
until some way off a thin grass held its own right up to the crest of the cliff. Overhead, forty or fifty feet of rock bulged into the great masses characteristic of chalk. But at the end of the ledge, a gully, a precipitous groove of discoloured rock, slashed the face of the cliff and gave a footing to a scrubby growth by which Udina and Uglomi went up and down. They stood as noiseless as startled deer, with every sense expectant. For a minute they heard nothing, and then came a faint rattling of dust down the gully, and the creaking of twigs. Uglomi gripped his axe and went to the edge of the ledge, for the bulge of the chalk overhead had hidden the upper part of the gully, and forthwith, with a sudden contraction of the heart, he saw the cave bear halfway down from the brow, and making a gingerly backward step with his flat hind foot. His hindquarters were towards Uglomi, and he clawed at the rocks and bushes, so that he seemed flattened against the cliff. He looked none the less for that, from his shining snout to his stumpy tail. He was a lion and a half, the length of two tall men. He looked over his shoulder, and his huge mouth was open with the exertion of holding up his great carcass, and his tongue lay out. He got his footing and came down slowly, a yard nearer. Bear, said Uglomi, looking round with his face white but Udina, with terror in her eyes, was pointing down the cliff. Uglomi's mouth fell open, for down below, with her big forefeet against the rock, stood another big brown-grey bulk, the she-bear. She was not so big as Andu, but she was big enough for all that. Then suddenly Uglomi gave a cry, and catching up a handful of the litter of ferns that lay scattered on the edge, he thrust it into the pallid ash of the fire. Brother fire, he cried, brother fire. And Udina, starting into activity, did likewise. Brother fire, help, help, brother fire. Brother fire was still red in his heart, but he turned to grey as they scattered him. "'Brother Fire!' they screamed, but he whispered and passed, and there was nothing but ashes. Then Uglomi danced with anger and struck the ashes with his fist. But Udina began to hammer the firestone against a flint, and the eyes of each were turning ever and again towards the gully, by which Andu was climbing down. Brother Fire! Suddenly the huge furry hindquarters of the bear came into view, beneath the bulge of the chalk that had hidden him. He was still clambering gingerly down the nearly vertical surface. His head was yet out of sight, but they could hear him talking to himself. Pig and monkey, said the cave bear. It ought to be good. Udina struck a spark and blew at it. It twinkled brighter and then went out. At that she cast down flint and firestone and stared blankly. Then she sprang to her feet and scrambled a yard or so up the cliff above the ledge. How she hung on, even for a moment, I do not know, for the chalk was vertical and without grip for a monkey. In a couple of seconds she had slid back down to the ledge again, with bleeding hands. Uglomi was making frantic rushes about the ledge. Now he would go to the edge, now to the gully. He did not know what to do. He could not think. The she-bear looked smaller than her mate. Much. If they rushed down on her together, one might live. Uh, said the cave bear, and Uglomi turned again and saw his little eyes peering under the bulge of the chalk. Udina, cowering at the edge of the ledge, began to scream like a gripped rabbit, 
At that, a sort of madness came upon Uglomi. With a mighty cry, he caught up his axe and ran towards Andu. The monster gave a grunt of surprise. In a moment, Uglomi was clinging to a bush right underneath the bear, and in another he was hanging to its back, half buried in fur, with one fist clutched in the hair under its jaw. The bear was too astonished at this fantastic attack to do more than cling passive, and then the axe, the first of all axes, rang on its skull. The bear's head twisted from side to side, and he began a petulant, scolding growl. The axe bit within an inch of the left eye, and the hot blood blinded that side. At that, the brute roared with surprise and anger, and his teeth gnashed six inches from Uglomi's face. Then the axe clubbed close, came down heavily on the corner of the jaw. The next blow blinded the right side and called forth a roar, this time of pain. Eudena saw the huge, flat feet slipping and sliding, and suddenly the bear gave a clumsy leap sideways, as if for the ledge. Then everything vanished, and the hazel smashed, and a roar of pain and a tumult of shouts and growls came up from far below. Eudena screamed and ran to the edge and peered over. For a moment, man and bears were a heap together. Uglo me uppermost, and then he had sprung clear and was scaling the gully again, with the bears rolling and striking at one another among the hazels. But he had left his axe below, and three knob-ended streaks of carmine were shooting down his thigh. Up! he cried, and in a moment Eudena was leading the way to the top of the cliff. In half a minute they were at the crest, their hearts pumping noisily, with Andu and his wife far and safe below them. Andu was sitting on his haunches, both paws at work, trying with quick, exasperated movements to wipe the blindness out of his eyes, and the she-bear stood on all fours, a little way off, ruffled in appearance and growling angrily. Uglomi flung himself flat on the grass and lay panting and bleeding with his face on his arms. For a second, Eudena regarded the bears. Then she came and sat beside him, looking at him. Presently, she put forth her hand timidly and touched him and made the guttural sound that was his name. He turned over and raised himself on his arm. His face was pale, like the face of one who is afraid. He looked at her steadfastly for a moment, and then suddenly he laughed. Wah! he said exultantly. Wah! she said, a simple but expressive conversation. Then Uglomi came and knelt beside her, and on hands and knees, peered over the brow and examined the gorge. His breath was steady now, and the blood on his leg had ceased to flow, though the scratches the she-bear had made were open and wide. He squatted up and sat staring at the footmarks of the great bear as they came to the gully. They were as wide as his head and twice as long. Then he jumped up and went along the cliff face, until the ledge was visible. Here he sat down for some time thinking, while Eudena watched him. Presently she saw the bears had gone. At last Uglomi rose, as one whose mind is made up. He returned towards the gully, Eudena keeping close by him, and together they clambered to the ledge. They took the firestone and the flint, and then Uglomi went down to the foot of the cliff, very cautiously, and found his axe. They returned to the cliff as quietly as they could, and set off at a brisk walk. The ledge was a home no longer, with such callers in the neighbourhood. Uglomi carried the axe, and Eudena the firestone. 
so simple was a Paleolithic removal. They went upstream, although it might lead to the very lair of the cave bear, because there was no other way to go. Down the stream was the tribe, and had not Uglomi killed Uya and Wa? By the stream they had to keep, because of drinking. So they marched through beech trees, with the gorge deepening until the river flowed, a frothing rapid, five hundred feet below them. Of all the changeful things in this world of change, the courses of rivers in deep valleys change least. It was the river way, the river we know today, and they marched over the very spots where nowadays stand Little Guildford and Godalming, the first human beings to come into the land. Once a grey ape chattered and vanished, and all along the cliff edge, vast and even, ran the spoor of the great cave bear. And then the spoor of the bear fell away from the cliff, showing, Uglomi thought, that he came from some place to the left, and keeping to the cliff's edge, they presently came to an end. They found themselves looking down on a great semicircular space caused by the collapse of the cliff. It had smashed right across the gorge, banking the upstream water back in a pool, which overflowed in a rapid. The slip had happened long ago. It was grassed over, but the face of the cliffs that stood about the semicircle was still almost fresh-looking, and white as on the day when the rock must have broken and slid down. Starkly exposed and black under the foot of these cliffs were the mouths of several caves, and as they stood there, looking at the space, and disinclined to skirt it, because they thought the bear's lair lay somewhere on the left in the direction they must needs take, they saw suddenly first one bear, and then two coming up the grass slope to the right and going across the amphitheatre towards the caves. Andu was first, he dropped a little on his forefoot, and his mien was despondent. And the she-bear came shuffling behind. Udina and Uglomi stepped back from the cliff until they could just see the bears over the verge. Then Uglomi stopped. Udina pulled his arm, but he turned with a forbidding gesture, and her hand dropped. Uglomi stood watching the bears, with his axe in his hand, until they vanished into the cave. He growled softly and shook the axe at the she-bear's receding quarters. Then to Udina's terror, instead of creeping off with her, he lay flat down and crawled forward into such a position that he could just see the cave. It was the bear's and he did it as calmly as if it had been rabbits he was watching. He lay still, like a barked log, sun-dappled in the shadow of the trees. He was thinking, and Udina had learnt, even when a little girl, that when Uglomi became still like that, jawbone on fist, novel things presently began to happen. It was an hour before the thinking was over. It was noon when the two little savages had found their way to the cliff brow that overhung the bear's cave, and all the long afternoon they fought desperately with a great boulder of chalk, trundling it with nothing but their unaided sturdy muscles from the gully where it had hung like a loose tooth towards the cliff top. It was full two yards about, it stood as high as Udina's waist. It was obtuse angled and toothed with flints, and when the sun set, it was poised three inches from the edge, above the cave of the great cave bear. In the cave, conversation languished during the afternoon. The she-bear snoozed sulkily in her corner, for she was fond of pig and monkey, and Andu was busy licking the side of his paw and smearing his face to cool the smart and inflammation of his wounds. 
Afterwards, he went and sat just within the mouth of the cave, blinking out at the afternoon sun with his uninjured eye and thinking. I never was so startled in my life, he said at last. They are the most extraordinary beasts, attacking me. I don't like them, said the she-bear, out in the darkness behind. A feebler sort of beast I never saw. I can't think what the world is coming to. Scraggy, weedy legs. Wonder how they keep warm in winter. Very likely they don't, said the she-bear. I suppose it's a sort of monkey gone wrong. It's a change, said the she-bear. A pause. The advantage he had was merely accidental, said Andu. These things will happen at times. I can't understand why you let go, said the she-bear. That matter had been discussed before and settled, so Andu, being a bear of experience, remained silent for a space. Then he resumed upon a different aspect of the matter. He has a sort of claw, a long claw that he seemed to have first on one paw and then on the other. Just one claw. They're very odd things. The bright thing, too, they seem to have, like that glare that comes in the sky in the daytime. Only it jumps about. It's really worth seeing. It's a thing with a root, too, like grass when it is windy. Does it bite? asked the she-bear. If it bites, it can't be a plant. No. I don't know said Andu. But it's curious anyhow. I wonder if they are good eating, said the she-bear. They look it, said Andu, with appetite, for the cave bear, like the polar bear, was an incurable carnivore. No roots or honey for him. The two bears fell into a meditation for a space. Then Andu resumed his simple attentions to his eye. The sunlight up the green slope before the cave mouth grew warmer in tone and warmer until it was a ruddy amber. Curious sort of thing, day, said the cave bear. Lot too much of it, I think. Quite unsuitable for hunting. Dazzles me always. I can't smell nearly so well by day. The she-bear did not answer, but there came a measured crunching sound out of the darkness. She had turned up a bone. Andu yawned. Well, he said. He strolled to the cave mouth and stood with his head projecting, surveying the amphitheatre. He found he had to turn his head completely round to see objects on his right-hand side, no doubt that I would be all right tomorrow. He yawned again. There was a tap overhead, and a big mass of chalk flew out from the cliff face, dropped a yard in front of his nose, and starred into a dozen unequal fragments. It startled him extremely. When he had recovered a little from his shock, he went and sniffed curiously at the representative pieces of the fallen projectile. They had a distinctive flavour, oddly reminiscent of two drab animals of the ledge. He sat up and poured the larger lump, and walked round it several times, trying to find a man about it somewhere. When the night had come, he went off down the river gorge to see if he could cut off either of the ledge's occupants. The ledge was empty. There were no signs of the red thing, but as he was rather hungry, he did not loiter long that night, but pushed on to pick up a red deer fawn. He forgot about the drab animals. He found a fawn, but the doe was close by and made an ugly fight for her young. Andu had to leave the fawn, 
but as her blood was up, she stuck to the attack, and at last he got in a blow of his paw on her nose, and so got hold of her. The next afternoon, curiously enough, the very fellow of the first white rock fell, and smashed precisely according to precedent. The aim of the third that fell the night after, however, was better. It hit Andu's unspeculative skull with a crack that echoed up the cliff, and the white fragments went dancing to all points of the compass. The she-bear, coming after him and sniffing curiously at him, found him lying in an odd sort of attitude, with his head wet and all out of shape. She was a young she-bear and inexperienced, and having sniffed about him for some time, and licked him a little, and so forth, she decided to leave him until the odd mood had passed, and went on her hunting alone. She looked up the fawn of the red doe they had killed two nights ago, and found it. But it was lonely hunting without Andu, and she returned cavewood before dawn. The sky was grey and overcast. The trees up the gorge were black and unfamiliar, and into her ursine mind came a dim sense of strange and dreary happenings. She lifted up her voice and called Andu by name. The sides of the gorge re-echoed her. As she approached the cave, she saw in the half-light and heard a couple of jackals scuttle off, and immediately after a hyena howled, and a dozen clumsy bulks went lumbering up the slope and stopped and yelled derision. Lord of the rocks and caves, yaha! came down the wind. The dismal feeling in the she-bear's mind became suddenly acute. She shuffled across the amphitheatre. Yaha! said the hyenas, retreating. Yaha! The cave bear was not lying quite in the same attitude, because the hyenas had been busy, and in one place his ribs showed white. Dotted over the turf about him lay the smashed fragments of the three great lumps of chalk, and the air was full of the scent of death. The she-bear stopped dead. Even now, that the great wonderful Andu was killed was beyond her believing. Then she heard far overhead a sound, a queer sound, a little like the shout of a hyena, but fuller and lower in pitch. She looked up, her little dawn-blinded eyes seeing little, her nostrils quivering, and there, on the cliff edge, far above her against the bright pink of dawn, were two little shaggy round dark things, the heads of Udina and Uglomi, as they shouted derision at her. But though she could not see them very distinctly, she could hear, and dimly she began to apprehend. A novel feeling, as of imminent strange evils, came into her heart. She began to examine the smashed fragments of chalk that lay about Andu. For a space she stood still, looking about her and making a low, continuous sound that was almost a moan. Then she went back incredulously to Andu to make one last effort to rouse him. Chapter 3 The First Horseman In the days before Uglomi, there was little trouble between the horses and men. They lived apart, the men in the river swamps and thickets, the horses on the wide grassy uplands between the chestnuts and the pines. Sometimes a pony would come straying into the clogging marshes to make a flint-hacked meal, and sometimes the tribe would find one, the kill of a lion, and drive off the jackals and feast heartily while the sun was high. These horses of the old time were clumsy at the fetlock and dun-coloured, with a rough tail and big head. They came every springtime northwestward into the country after the swallows and before the hippopotami, as the grass on the wide downland stretches grew long. They came only in small bodies thus far, each herd 
a stallion and two or three mares, and a foal or so, having its own stretch of country, and they went again, when the chestnut trees were yellow and the wolves came down to the Wealden Mountains. It was their custom to graze right out in the open, going into cover only in the heat of day. They avoided the long stretches of thorn and beechwood, preferring an isolated group of trees, void of ambuscada, so that it was hard to come upon them. They were never fighters, their heels and teeth were for one another, but in the clear country, once they were started, no living thing came near them, though perhaps the elephant might have done so, had he felt the need. And in those days man seemed a harmless thing enough. No whisper of prophetic intelligence told the species of the terrible slavery that was to come, of the whip and spur and bearing rein, the clumsy load and the slippery street, the insufficient food and the knacker's yard that was to replace the wide grassland and the freedom of the earth. Down in the way marshes, Uglomi and Udina had never seen the horses closely, but now they saw them every day, as the two of them raided out from their lair on the ledge of the gorge, raiding together in search of food. They had returned to the ledge after the killing of Andu, for of the she-bear they were not afraid. The she-bear had become afraid of them, and when she winded them, she went aside. The two went together everywhere, for since they had left the tribe, Udina was not so much Uglomi's woman as his mate. She learnt to hunt even, as much, that is, as any woman could. She was indeed a marvellous woman. He would lie for hours watching a beast, or planning catches in that shock head of his, and she would stay beside him, with her bright eyes upon him, offering no irritating suggestions, as still as any man. A wonderful woman. At the top of the cliff was an open grassy lawn, and then beechwoods, and going through the beechwoods one came to the edge of the rolling grassy expanse, and in sight of the horses. Here, on the edge of the wood and bracken, were the rabbit burrows, and here among the fronds, Udina and Uglomi would lie with their throwing stones, ready, until the little people came out to nibble and play in the sunset. And while Udina would sit, a silent figure of watchfulness regarding the burrows, Uglomi's eyes were ever away across the greensward at those wonderful grazing strangers. In a dim way, he appreciated their grace and their supple nimbleness. As the sun declined in the evening time and the heat of the day passed, they would become active, would start chasing one another, neighing, dodging, shaking their manes, coming round in great curves, sometimes so close that the pounding of the turf sounded like hurried thunder. It looked so fine that Uglomi wanted to join in badly, and sometimes one would roll over on the turf, kicking four hooves heavenward, which seemed formidable and was certainly much less alluring. Dim imaginings ran through Uglomi's mind as he watched, by virtue of which two rabbits lived longer. And sleeping, his brains were clearer and bolder, for that was the way of those days. He came near the horses, he dreamt and fought, smiting stone against hoof, but then the horses changed to men, or, at least, to men with horses' heads, and he awoke in a cold sweat of terror. Yet the next day in the morning, as the horses were grazing, one of the mares whinnied, and they saw Uglomi coming up the wind. They all stopped their eating and watched him. Uglomi was not coming towards them, but strolling obliquely across the open, looking at anything in the world but horses. He had stuck three fern fronds into the mat of his hair, 
giving him a remarkable appearance, and he walked very slowly. "'What's up now?' said the master horse, who was capable but inexperienced. "'It looks more like the first half of an animal than anything else in the world,' he said. Four legs and no hind. "'It's only one of those pink monkey things,' said the eldest mare. "'They're a sort of river monkey. They're quite common on the plains.' Uglomi continued his oblique advance. The eldest mare was struck with the want of motive in his proceedings. Fool, said the eldest mare, in a quick, conclusive way that she had. She resumed her grazing. The master horse and the second mare followed suit. Look, he's nearer, said the foal with a stripe. One of the younger foals made uneasy movements. Uglomi squatted down and sat regarding the horses fixedly. In a little while he was satisfied that they meant neither flight nor hostilities. He began to consider his next procedure. He did not feel anxious to kill, but he had his axe with him and the spirit of sport was upon him. How would one kill one of these creatures, these great, beautiful creatures? Eudena, watching him with a fearful admiration from the cover of the bracken, saw him presently go on all fours, and so proceed again. But the horses preferred him a biped to a quadruped, and the master horse threw up his head and gave the word to move. Uglomi thought they were off for good, but after a minute's gallop they came round in a wide curve and stood winding him. Then... As a rise in the ground hid him, they tailed out, the master horse leading and approached him spirally. He was as ignorant of the possibilities of a horse as they were of his, and at this stage it would seem he funked. He knew this kind of stalking would make red deer or buffalo charge, if it were persisted in. At any rate, Eudena saw him jump up and come walking towards her, with the fern plumes held in his hand. He stood up, and he grinned to show that the whole thing was an immense lark, and that what he had done was just what he had planned to do from the very beginning. So that incident ended. But he was very thoughtful, all that day. The next day, this foolish drab creature with the leonine mane, instead of going about the grazing or hunting he was made for, was prowling round the horses again. The eldest mare was all for silent contempt. I suppose he wants to learn something from us, she said, and let him. The next day he was at it again. The master horse decided he meant absolutely nothing. But as a matter of fact, Uglomi, the first of men to feel that curious spell of the horse that binds us even to this day, meant a great deal. He admired them unreservedly. There was a rudiment of the snob in him, I'm afraid, and he wanted to be near those beautifully curved animals. Then... There were vague conceptions of a kill. If only they would let him come near them. But they drew the line, he found, at fifty yards. If he came nearer than that, they moved off, with dignity. I suppose it was the way he had blinded Andu that made him think of leaping on the back of one of them. But though Eudena, after a time, came out in the open too, and they did some unobtrusive stalking, Things stopped there. Then one memorable day, a new idea came to Uglomi. The horse looks down and level, but he does not look up. No animals look up. They have too much common sense. It was only that fantastic creature, man, could waste his wits skyward. Uglomi made no philosophical deductions, but he perceived the thing was so. So he spent a weary day in a beach that stood in the open, 
while Eudina stalked. Usually the horses went into the shade in the heat of the afternoon, but that day the sky was overcast, and they would not, in spite of Eudina's solicitude. It was two days after that that Uglomi had his desire. The day was blazing hot, and the multiplying flies asserted themselves. The horses stopped grazing before midday, and came into the shadows below him, and stood in couples, nose to tail, flapping. The master horse, by virtue of his heels, came closest to the tree, and suddenly there was a rustle and a creak and a thud. Then a sharp, chipped flint bit him on the cheek. The master horse stumbled, came on one knee, rose to his feet, and was off like the wind. The air was full of the whirl of limbs, the prance of hoofs, and snorts of alarm. Uglomi was pitched a foot in the air, came down again, up again, his stomach was hit violently, and then his knees got a grip of something between them. He found himself clutching with knees, feet, and hands, careering violently with extraordinary oscillation through the air, his axe gone heaven knows whither. Hold tight, said Mother Instinct, and he did. He was aware of a lot of coarse hair in his face, some of it between his teeth, and of green turf streaming past in front of his eyes. He saw the shoulder of the master horse, vast and sleek, with the muscles flowing swiftly under his skin. He perceived that his arms were round the neck, and that the violent jerkings he experienced had a sort of rhythm. Then he was in the midst of a wild rush of tree stems, and then there were fronds of bracken about, and then more open turf. Then a stream of pebbles rushing past, little pebbles flying sideways athwart the stream from the blow of the swift hooves. Uglomi began to feel frighteningly sick and giddy, but he was not the stuff to leave go simply because he was uncomfortable. He dared not leave his grip, but he tried to make himself more comfortable. He released his hug on the neck, gripping the mane instead. He slipped his knee forward and, pushing back, came into a sitting position where the quarters broaden. It was nervous work, but he managed it and at last he was fairly seated astride, breathless indeed and uncertain, but with that frightful pounding of his body at any rate relieved. Slowly the fragments of Uglomi's mind got into order again. The pace seemed to him terrific, but a kind of exultation was beginning to oust his first frantic terror. The air rushed by, sweet and wonderful, the rhythm of the hooves changed and broke up and returned into itself again. They were on turf now, a wide glade, the beech trees a hundred yards away on either side, and a succulent band of green starred with pink blossom and shot with silver water here and there, meandered down the middle. Far off there was a glimpse of blue valley, far away. The exultation grew. It was man's first taste of pace. Then came a wide space dappled with flying fallow deer, scattering this way and that, and then a couple of jackals, mistaking Uglomi for a lion, came hurrying after him. And when they saw it was not a lion, they still came on out of curiosity. On galloped the horse, with his one idea of escape, and after him the jackals, with pricked ears and quickly barked remarks. "'Which kills which?' said the first jackal. "'It's the horse being killed,' said the second. They gave the howl of following, and the horse answered to it as a horse answers nowadays to the spur. On they rushed, a little tornado through the quiet day putting up startled birds, sending a dozen unexpected things darting to cover, raising a myriad of indignant dung-flies, smashing little blossoms, flowering complacently, back into their parental turf. 
trees again, and then splash, splash across a torrent. Then a hare shot out of the tuft of grass under the very hooves of the master horse, and the jackals left them incontinently. So presently they broke into the open again, a wide expanse of turfy hillside, the very grassy downs that fall northward nowadays from the Epsom stand. The first hot bolt of the master horse was long since over. He was falling into a measured trot, and Uglomi, albeit bruised exceedingly and quite uncertain of the future, was in a state of glorious enjoyment. And now came a new development. The pace broke again. The master horse came round on a short curve and stopped dead. Uglomi became alert. He wished he had a flint, but the throwing flint he had carried in a thong about his waist was, like the axe, heaven knows where. The master horse turned his head, and Uglomi became aware of an eye and teeth. He whipped his leg into a position of security and hit at the cheek with his fist. Then the head went down somewhere out of existence, apparently, and the back he was sitting on flew up into a dome. Uglomi became a thing of instinct again, strictly prehensile. He held by knees and feet, and his head seemed sliding towards the turf. His fingers were twisted into the shock of mane, and the rough hair of the horse saved him. The gradient he was on lowered again, and then, whop, said Uglomi, astonished, and the slant was the other way up. But Uglomi was a thousand generations nearer the primordial than man. No monkey could have held on better, and the lion had been training the horse for countless generations, against the tactics of rolling and rearing back. But he kicked like a master, and buck-jumped rather neatly. In five minutes Uglomi lived a lifetime. If he came off, the horse would kill him he felt assured. Then the master horse decided to stick to his old tactics again, and suddenly went off at a gallop. He headed down the slope, taking the steep places at a rush, swerving neither to the right nor to the left, and, as they rode down, the wide expanse of valley sank out of sight behind the approaching skirmishers of oak and hawthorn. They skirted a sudden hollow with the pool of a spring, rank weeds and silver bushes. The ground grew softer and the grass taller, and on the right-hand side and the left came scattered bushes of may, still splashed with belated blossom. Presently bushes thickened until they lashed the passing rider, and little flashes and gouts of blood came out on horse and man. Then the way opened again, and then came a wonderful adventure. A sudden squeal of unreasonable anger rose amidst the bushes, the squeal of some creature bitterly wronged, and crashing after them appeared a big grey-blue shape. It was Yah, the big-horned rhinoceros, in one of those fits of fury of his, charging full tilt after the manner of his kind. He had been startled at his feeding, and someone, it did not matter who, was to be ripped and trampled, therefore. He was bearing down on them from the left, with his wicked little eye red, his great horn down, and his tail like a jury mast behind him. For a minute Ugloli was minded to slip off and dodge, and then, behold, the staccato of the hooves grew swifter and the rhinoceros and his stumpy, hurrying little legs seemed to slide out at the back corner of Uglomi's eye. In two minutes they were through the bushes of May and out in the open, going fast. For a space he could hear the ponderous paces in pursuit receding behind him, and then it was just as if Yah had not lost his temper, as if Yah had never existed. The pace never faltered. On they rode and on. Uglomi was now all exultation. To exult in those days was to insult. 
Yaha, big nose, he said, trying to crane back and see some remote speck of a pursuer. Why don't you carry your smiting stone in your fist? He ended with a frantic whoop. But that whoop was unfortunate, for coming close to the ear of the horse and being quite unexpected, it startled the stallion extremely. He shied violently. Uglomi suddenly found himself uncomfortable again. He was hanging on to the horse he found by one arm and one knee. The rest of the ride was honourable but unpleasant. The view was chiefly of blue sky, and that was combined with most unpleasant physical sensation. Finally, a brush of thorn lashed him, and he let go. He hit the ground with his cheek and shoulder, and then, after a complicated and extraordinarily rapid movement, hit it again with the end of his backbone. He saw splashes and sparks of light and colour. The ground seemed bouncing about, just like the horse had done. Then he found he was sitting on turf, six yards beyond the bush. In front of him was a space of grass, growing greener and greener, and a number of human beings in the distance, and the horse was going round at a smart gallop, quite a long way off to the right. The human beings were on the opposite bank of the river, some still in the water, but they were all running away as hard as they could go. The advent of a monster that took to pieces was not the sort of novelty they cared for. For quite a minute Uglomi sat regarding them in a purely spectacular spirit. The bend of the river, the knoll among the reeds and royal ferns, the thin streams of smoke going up to heaven, were all perfectly familiar to him. It was the squatting place of the sons of Uya, of Uya from whom he had fled with Udina, and whom he had waylaid in the chestnut woods and killed with the first axe. He rose to his feet, still dazed from his fall, and as he did so, the scattering fugitives turned and regarded him. Some pointed to the receding horse and chattered. He walked slowly towards them, staring. He forgot the horse, he forgot his own bruises in the growing interest of this encounter. There were fewer of them than there had been. He supposed the others must have hid. The heap of fern for the night fire was not so high. By the flint heaps should have sat wow. But then he remembered he had killed Wow. Suddenly brought back to this familiar scene, the gorge and the bears and Udina seemed things remote, things dreamt of. He stopped at the bank and stood regarding the tribe. His mathematical abilities were of the slightest, but it was certain there were fewer. The men might be away, but there were fewer women and children. He gave the shout of homecoming. His quarrel had been with Uya, and Wow, not with the others. Children of Uya, he cried. They answered with his name, a little fearfully because of the strange way he had come. For a space they spoke together. Then an old woman lifted a shrill voice and answered him, Our Lord is the Lion! Uglomi did not understand that saying. They answered him again, several together. Uya comes again. He comes as a lion. Our Lord is a lion. He comes at night. He slays whom he will. But none other may slay us. Uglomi, none other may slay us. Still Uglomi did not understand. Our Lord is a lion. He speaks no more to men. Uglomi stood regarding them. He had had dreams. He knew that though he had killed Uya, Uya still existed. And now they told him Uya was a lion. The shriveled old woman, the mistress of the fireminders, suddenly turned and spoke softly to those next to her. She was a very old woman indeed. She had been the first of Uya's wives, 
and he had let her live beyond the age to which it is seemly a woman should be permitted to live. She had been cunning from the first. Cunning to please Uya and get food, and now she was great in counsel. She spoke softly, and Uglomi watched her shriveled form across the river with a curious distaste. Then she called aloud, Come over to us, Uglomi. A girl suddenly lifted up her voice, Come over to us, Uglomi, she said, and they all began crying, Come over to us, Uglomi. It was strange how their manner changed after the old woman called. He stood quite still watching them all. It was pleasant to be called, and the girl who had called first was a pretty one. But she made him think of Udina. Come over to us, Uglomi, they cried, and the voice of the shriveled old woman rose above them all. At the sound of her voice, his hesitation returned. He stood on the river bank, Uglomi, Ug the thinker with his thoughts slowly taking shape. Presently, one then another paused to see what he would do. He was minded to go back. He was minded not to. Suddenly his fear or his caution got the upper hand. Without answering them, he turned and walked back towards the distant thorn trees, the way he had come. Forthwith, the whole tribe started crying to him again, very eagerly. He hesitated and turned. Then he went on. Then he turned again. And then once again, regarding them with troubled eyes, as they called. The last time he took two paces back, before his fear stopped him. They saw him stop once more and suddenly shake his head and vanish among the hawthorn trees. Then all the women and children lifted up their voices together and called to him in one last vain effort. Far down the river the reeds were stirring in the breeze, where, convenient for his new sort of feeding, the old lion who had taken to man-eating had made his lair. The old woman turned her face that way and pointed to the hawthorn thickets. Ouya! she screamed. There goes thine enemy! There goes thine enemy, Yuya! Why do you devour us nightly? We have tried to snare him. There goes thine enemy, Yuya! But the lion who preyed upon the tribe was taking his siesta. The cry went unheard. That day he had dined on one of the plumper girls, and his mood was a comfortable placidity. He really did not understand that he was Uya or that Uglomi was his enemy. So it was that Uglomi rode the horse and heard first of Uya the lion, who had taken the place of Uya the master, and was eating up the tribe and as he hurried back to the gorge, his mind was no longer full of the horse, but of the thought that Uya was still alive, to slay or be slain. Over and over again he saw the shrunken band of women and children crying that Uya was a lion. Uya was a lion! And presently, fearing the twilight might come upon him, Uglomi began running. Chapter 4 Ouya the Lion The old lion was in luck. The tribe had a certain pride in their ruler, but that was all the satisfaction they got out of it. He came the very night that Uglomi killed Ouya the Cunning, and so it was they named him Ouya. It was the old woman, the fireminder, who first named him Ouya. A shower had lowered the fires to a glow and made the night dark. And as they conversed together and peered at one another in the darkness and wondered fearfully what Ouya would do to them in their dreams now that he was dead, 
they heard the mounting reverberation of the lion's roar close at hand. Then everything was still. They held their breath so that almost the only sounds were the patter of the rain and the hiss of the raindrops in the ashes. And then, after an interminable time, a crash and a shriek of fear and growling. They sprang to their feet, shouting, screaming, running this way and that, but brands would not burn, and in a minute the victim was being dragged away through the ferns. It was Urk, the brother of Wow. So the lion came. The ferns were still wet from the rain the next night, and he came and took click with the red hair. That sufficed for two nights, and then in the dark between the moons he came three nights, night after night, and that though they had good fires. He was an old lion with stumpy teeth, but very silent and very cool. He knew of fires before. These were not the first of mankind that ministered to his old age. The third night he came between the outer fire and the inner, and he let the flint heap and pulled down Urm, son of Urk, who had seemed like to be the leader. That was a dreadful night, because they lit great flares of fern and ran screaming, and the lion missed his hold of Urm. By the glare of the fire they saw Urm struggle up and run a little way towards them, and then the lion in two bounds had him down again. That was the last of Urm. So fear came, and all the delight of spring passed out of their lives. Already there were five gone out of the tribe, and four knights added three more to the number. Food-seeking became spiritless. None knew who might go next, and all day the women toiled, even the favourite women, gathering litter and sticks for the night fires. And the hunters hunted ill. In the warm springtime, hunger came again, as though it was still winter. The tribe might have moved, had they had a leader, but they had no leader and none knew where to go that the lion could not follow them. So the old lion waxed fat, and thanked heaven for the kindly race of men. Two of the children and a youth died while the moon was still new. And then it was the shriveled old fireminder first bethought herself in a dream of Udina and Uglomi, and of the way Uya had been slain. She had lived in fear of Uya all her days, and now she lived in fear of the lion. That Uglomi could kill Uya for good, Uglomi whom she had seen born, was impossible. It was Uya still seeking his enemy. And then came the strange return of Uglomi, a wonderful animal seen galloping far across the river that suddenly changed into two animals a horse and a man. Following this portent, the vision of Uglomi on the farther bank of the river, yes, it was all plain to her. Uya was punishing them because they had not hunted down Uglomi and Udina. The men came straggling back to the chances of the night while the sun was still golden in the sky. They were received with the story of Uglomi. She went across the river with them and showed them his spoor hesitating on the farther bank. Sis, the tracker, knew the feat for Uglomi's. Uya needs Uglomi, cried the old woman, standing on the left of the bend, a gesticulating figure of flaring bronze in the sunset. Her cries were strange sounds, flitting to and fro on the borderland of speech, but this was the sense they carried. The lion needs Udina. He comes night after night seeking Udina and Uglomi. When he cannot find Udina and Uglomi, he grows angry and he kills. Hunt Udina and Uglomi. Udina, whom he pursued, and Uglomi, 
for whom he gave the death word. Hunt Udina and Uglomi. She turned to the distant reed bed, as sometimes she had turned to Uya in his life. Is it not so, my lord? she cried, and as if in answer, the tall reeds bowed before a breath of wind. Far into the twilight, the sound of hacking was heard from the squatting places. It was the men sharpening their ashen spears against the hunting of tomorrow. And in the night, early before the moon rose, the lion came and took the girl of Sis, the tracker. In the morning before the sun had risen, Sis the tracker and the lad Wow How, who now chipped flints, and One Eye and Bow and the snail eater, the two red haired men and the cat skin and snake, all the men that were left alive of the sons of Uya, taking their ash spears and their smiting stones, and with throwing stones in the beast paw bags, started forth upon the trail of Uglomi through the hawthorn thickets where Yah the rhinoceros and his brothers were feeding, and up the bare downland towards the beech woods. That night the fires burnt high and fierce as the waxing moon set and the lion left the crouching women and children in peace. And the next day, while the sun was still high, the hunters returned, all save one eye who lay dead with a smashed skull at the foot of the ledge. When Uglomi came back that evening from stalking the horses, he found the vultures already busy over him, and with them the hunters brought Udina bruised and wounded but alive. That had been the strange order of the shriveled old woman, that she was to be brought alive. She is no kill for us, she is for Uya the lion. Her hands were tied with thongs, as though she had been a man, and she came weary and drooping, her hair over her eyes and matted with blood. They walked about her, and ever and again the snail eater, whose name she had given, would laugh and strike her with his ashen spear. And after he had struck her with his spear, he would look over his shoulder like one who had done an overbold deed. The others, too, looked over their shoulders ever and again, and all were in a hurry save Udina. When the old woman saw them coming, she cried aloud with joy. They made Udina cross the river with her hands tied, although the current was strong, and when she slipped, the old woman screamed first with joy, and then for fear she might be drowned. And when they had dragged Udina to the shore, she could not stand for a time, albeit they beat her sore. So they let her sit with her feet touching the water and her eyes staring before her, and her face set, whatever they might do or say. All the tribe came down to the squatting place, even curly little Haha who as yet could scarcely toddle, and soon, staring at Udina and the old woman, as now we should stare at some strange wounded beast and its captor, the old woman tore off the necklace of Uya that was about Udina's neck and put it on herself. She had been the first to wear it. Then she tore at Udina's hair and took a spear from Sis and beat her with all her might. And when she had vented the warmth of her heart on the girl, she looked closely into her face. Eudina's eyes were closed, and her features were set, and she lay so still that for a moment the old woman feared she was dead. And then her nostrils quivered. At that the old woman slapped her face and laughed, and gave the spear to Sis again, and went a little way off from her, and began to talk and jeer at her after her manner. The old woman had more words than any in the tribe, and her talk was a terrible thing to hear. Sometimes she screamed and moaned incoherently, and sometimes the shape of her guttural cries was the mere phantom of thoughts. But she conveyed to Udina, nevertheless, 
much of the things that were yet to come, of the lion and of the torment he would do her. And Uglomi, ha, Uglomi is slain? And suddenly Udina's eyes opened, and she sat up again, and her look met the old woman's fair and level. No, she said slowly, like one trying to remember. I did not see my Uglomi slain. I did not see my Uglomi slain. Tell her, cried the old woman. Tell her, he that killed him, tell her how Uglomi was slain. She looked, and all the women and children there looked, from man to man. None answered her. They stood shame-faced. Tell her, said the old woman. The men looked at one another. Eudena's face suddenly lit. Tell her, she said. Tell her, mighty men, tell her the killing of Uglomi. The old woman rose and struck her sharply across the mouth. We could not find Uglomi, said Sis the Tracker slowly. Who hunts too, kills none. Then Eudena's heart leapt, but she kept her face hard. It was as well, for the old woman looked at her sharply, with murder in her eyes. Then the old woman turned her tongue upon the men, because they had feared to go on after Uglomi. She dreaded no one now Uya was slain. She scolded them as one scolds children, and they scowl at her, and began to accuse one another, until suddenly Sis the Tracker raised his voice and bade her hold her peace. And so, when the sun was setting, they took Udina and went, though their hearts sank within them, along the trail the old lion had made in the reeds. All the men went together. At one place was a group of alders, and here they hastily bound Udina, where the lion might find her when he came abroad in the twilight. And having done so, they hurried back until they were near the squatting place. Then they stopped. Sis stopped first and looked back again at the alders. They could see her head even from the squatting place, a little black shock under the limb of the larger tree. That was as well. All the women and children stood watching upon the crest of the mound, and the old woman stood and screamed for the lion to take her whom he sought, and counselled him on the torments he might do her. Udina was very weary now, stunned by beatings and fatigue and sorrow, and only the fear of the thing that was still to come upheld her. The sun was broad and blood-red between the stems of the distant chestnuts, and the west was all on fire. The evening breeze had died to a warm tranquillity. The air was full of midge swarms. The fish in the river hard by would leap at times, and now and again a cockchaffer would drone through the air. Out of the corner of her eye, Eudina could see a part of the squatting knoll, and little figures standing and staring at her. And, a very little sound, but very clear, she could hear the beating of the firestone. Dark and near to her, and still, was the reed-fringed thicket of the lair. Presently the firestone ceased. She looked for the sun and found he had gone, and overhead and growing brighter was the waxing moon. She looked towards the thicket of the lair, seeking shapes in the reeds, and then suddenly she began to wriggle and wriggle, weeping and calling upon Uglomi. But Uglomi was far away. When they saw her head moving with her struggles, they shouted together on the knoll, and she desisted and was still. And then came the bats, and the star that was like Uglomi crept out of its blue hiding place in the west. She called to it, but softly, because she feared the lion, and all through the coming of the twilight the thicket was still. So the dark crept upon Eudena, 
and the moon grew bright, and the shadows of things that had fled up the hillside and vanished with the evening came back to them short and black. And the dark shapes in the thicket of reeds and alders, where the lion lay, gathered, and a faint stir began there. But nothing came out therefrom all through the gathering of the darkness. She looked at the squatting place, and soon the fires glowing smoky red, and the men and women going to and fro. The other way, over the river, a white mist was rising. Then far away came the whimpering of young foxes and the yell of a hyena. There were long gaps of aching waiting. After a long time, some animals splashed in the water and seemed to cross the river at the ford beyond the lair. But what animal it was she could not see. From the distant drinking pools she could hear the sound of splashing and the noise of elephants. So still was the night. The earth was now a colourless arrangement of white reflections and impenetrable shadows under the blue sky. The silvery moon was already spotted with filigree crests of the chestnut woods, and over the shadowy eastward hills the stars were multiplying. The knoll fires were bright red now, and black figures stood waiting against them. They were waiting for a scream. Surely it would be soon. The night suddenly seemed full of movement. She held her breath. Things were passing. One, two, three. Subtly sleeking shadows. Jackals. Then a long waiting again. Then, asserting itself, as real at once over all the sounds her mind had imagined, came a stir in the thicket, then a vigorous movement. There was a snap. The reeds crashed heavily, once, twice, thrice, and then everything was still, save a measured swishing. She heard a low, tremulous growl, and then everything was still again. The stillness lengthened. Would it never end? She held her breath. She bit her lip to stop screaming. Then something scuttled through the undergrowth. Her scream was involuntary. She did not hear the answering yell from the mound. Immediately the thicket woke up to vigorous movement again. She saw the grass stems waving in the light of the setting moon. The alders swaying. She struggled violently, her last struggle. But nothing came towards her. A dozen monsters seemed rushing about in that little place for a couple of minutes, and then again came silence. The moon sank behind the distant chestnuts, and the night was dark. Then an odd sound, a sobbing, panting, that grew faster and feigned her. Yet another silence, and then dim sounds, and the grunting of some animal. Everything was still again. Far away eastward an elephant trumpeted, and from the woods came a snarling and yelping that died away. In the long interval the moon shone out again, between the stems of the trees on the ridge, sending two great bars of light and a bar of darkness across the reedy waste. Then came a steady rustling, a splash and the reeds swayed wider and wider apart, and at last they broke open, cleft from root to crest. The end had come. She looked to see the thing that had come out of the reeds. For a moment it seemed certainly the great head and jaw she expected, and then it dwindled and changed. It was a dark, low thing that remained silent, but it was not the lion. It became still. Everything became still. She peered. It was like some gigantic frog. Two limbs and a slanting body. Its head moved about, searching the shadows. A rustle, and it moved clumsily, with a sort of hopping, and as it moved, it gave a low groan. 
The blood rushing through her veins was suddenly joy. Uglomi, she whispered. The thing stopped. Udina, he answered softly with pain in his voice and peering into the alders. He moved again and came out of the shadow beyond the reeds into the moonlight. All his body was covered with dark smears. She saw he was dragging his legs and that he gripped his axe, the first axe, in one hand. In another moment he had struggled into the position of all fours and had staggered over to her. The lion, he said in a strange mingling of exultation and anguish. Wow, I have slain a lion with my own hand, even as I slew the great bear. He moved to emphasize his words and suddenly broke off with a faint cry. For a space he did not move. Let me free, whispered Udina. He answered her no words, but pulled himself up from his crawling attitude by means of the older stem, and hacked at her thongs with the sharp edge of his axe. She heard him sob at each blow. He cut away the thongs about her chest and arms, and then his hand dropped. His chest struck against her shoulder, and he slipped down beside her and lay still. But the rest of her release was very easy. Very hastily she freed herself. She made one step from the tree and her head was spinning. Her last conscious movement was towards him. She reeled and dropped. Her hand fell upon his thigh. It was soft and wet and gave way under her pressure. He cried out at her touch and writhed and lay still again. Presently a dark, dog-like shape came very softly through the reeds, then stopped dead and stood sniffing, hesitated and at last turned and slunk back into the shadows. Long was the time they remained there motionless, with the light of the setting moon shining on their limbs. Very slowly, as slowly as the setting of the moon, did the shadow of the reeds towards the mound flow over them. Presently their legs were hidden, and Uglomi was but a bust of silver. The shadow crept up to his neck, crept over his face, and so at last the darkness of the night swallowed them up. The shadow became full of instinctive stirrings. There was a patter of feet, a faint snarling, the sound of a blow. There was little sleep that night for the women and children at the squatting place until they heard Udina scream. But the men were weary and sat dozing. When Udina screamed, they felt assured of their safety and hurried to get the nearest places to the fires. The old woman laughed at the scream and laughed again because C, the little friend of Udina, whimpered. Directly the dawn came, they were all alert and looking towards the alders. They could see that Udina had been taken. They could not help feeling glad to think that Uya was appeased. But across the minds of the men, the thought of Uglomi fell like a shadow. They could understand revenge, for the world was old in revenge, but they did not think of rescue. Suddenly a hyena fled out of the thicket and came galloping across the reed space. His muzzle and paws were dark stained. At that sight all the men shouted and clutched at throwing stones and ran towards him. For no animal is so pitiful a coward as the hyena by day. All men hated the hyena because he preyed on children and would come and bite when one was sleeping on the edge of the squatting place. And Cat's skin, throwing fair and straight, hit the brute shrewdly on the flank, whereat the whole tribe yelled with delight. At the noise they made there came a flapping of wings from the lair of the lion, and three white-headed vultures rose slowly 
and circled and came to rest amidst the branches of the older, overlooking the lair. Our lord is abroad, said the old woman, pointing. The vultures have their share of Udina. For a space they remained there, and then first one and then another dropped back into the thicket. Then over the eastern woods, and touching the whole world to life and colour, poured with the exaltation of a trumpet blast the light of the rising sun. At the sight of him the children shouted together and clapped their hands and began to race off towards the water. Only little C lagged behind and looked wonderingly at the alders where she had seen the head of Udina overnight. But Ouya, the old lion, was not abroad, but at home. And he lay very still and a little on one side. He was not in his lair, but a little way from it, in a place of trampled grass. Under one eye was a little wound, the feeble little bite of the first axe. But all the ground beneath his chest was ruddy brown, with a vivid streak, and in his chest was a little hole that had been made by Uglomi's stabbing spear. Along his side and at his neck the vultures had marked their claims, for so Uglomi had slain him, lying stricken under his paw and thrusting haphazard at his chest. He had driven the spear in with all his strength and stabbed the giant to the heart. So it was the reign of the lion, of the second incarnation of Uya the master, came to an end. From the knoll the bustle of preparation grew, the hacking of spears and throwing stones. None spake the name of Uglomi, for fear that it might bring him. The men were going to keep together, close together, in the hunting for a day or so and their hunting was to be Uglomi, lest instead he should come a-hunting them. But Uglomi was lying very still and silent outside the lion's lair, and Udina squatted beside him with the ash spear, all smeared with lion's blood, gripped in her hand. Chapter 5 the fight in the lion's thicket. Uglomi lay still, his back against an alder, and his thigh was a red mass, terrible to see. No civilized man could have lived who had been so sorely wounded. But Udina got him thorns to close his wounds, and squatted beside him day and night, smiting the flies from him with a fan of reeds by day, and in the night threatening the hyenas with the first axe in her hand. And in a little while he began to heal. It was high summer, and there was no rain, little food they had during the first two days his wounds were open. In the low place where they hid there were no roots nor little beasts, and the stream, with its water snails and fish, was in the open, a hundred yards away. She could not go abroad by day for fear of the tribe, her brothers and sisters, nor by night for fear of the beasts, both on his account and hers. So they shared the lion with the vultures, but there was a trickle of water nearby, and Udina brought him plenty in her hands. Where Uglomi lay was well hidden from the tribe by a thicket of alders, and all fenced about with bulrushes and tall reeds. The dead lion he had killed lay near his old lair, on a place of trampled reeds fifty yards away, in sight through the reed stems, and the vultures fought each other for the choicest pieces and kept the jackals off him. Very soon a cloud of flies that looked like beasts hung over him, and Uglomi could hear their humming. And when Uglomi's flesh was already healing, and it was not many days before that began, 
Only a few bones of the lion remained, scattered and shining white. For the most part, Uglomi sat still during the day, looking before him at nothing. Sometimes he would mutter of the horses and bears and lions, and sometimes he would beat the ground with the first axe and say the names of the tribe. He seemed to have no fear of bringing the tribe for hours together. But chiefly he slept, dreaming little because of his loss of blood and the slightness of his food. During the short summer night, both kept awake. All the while the darkness lasted, things moved about them. Things they never saw by day. For some nights the hyenas did not come, and then one moonless night near a dozen came and fought for what was left of the lion. The night was a tumult of growling, and Uglomi and Udina could hear the bones snap in their teeth but they knew the hyena dare not attack any creature alive and awake, and so they were not greatly afraid. Of a daytime, Udina would go along the narrow path the old lion had made in the reeds until she was beyond the bend, and then she would creep into the thicket and watch the tribe. She would lie close by the alders, where they had bound her to offer her up to the lion and thence she could see them on the knoll by the fire, small and clear, as she had seen them that night. But she told Uglomi little of what she saw, because she feared to bring them by their names, for so they believed in those days that naming called. She saw the men prepare stabbing spears, and throwing stones on the morning after Uglomi had slain the lion, and go out to hunt him, leaving the women and children on the knoll. Little they knew how near he was as they tracked off in single file towards the hills, with Sis the tracker leading them, and she watched the women and children after the men had gone, gathering fern fronds and twigs for the night fire, and the boys and girls running and playing together. But the very old woman made her feel afraid. Towards noon, when most of the others were down at the stream by the bend, she came and stood on the hither side of the knoll, a gnarled brown figure, and gesticulated so that Udina could scarce believe she was not seen. Udina lay like a hare in its form, with shining eyes fixed on the bent witch away there, and presently she dimly understood it was the lion the old woman was worshipping, the lion Uglomi had slain. And the next day the hunters came back weary, carrying a fawn, and Udina watched the feast enviously, and then came a strange thing. She saw, distinctly she heard, the old woman shrieking and gesticulating and pointing towards her. She was afraid and crept like a snake out of sight again. But presently curiosity overcame her, and she was back at her spying place, and as she peered her heart stopped, for there were all the men, with their weapons in their hands, walking together towards her from the knoll. She dared not move, lest her movement should be seen, but she pressed herself close to the ground. The sun was low, and the golden light was in the faces of the men. She saw they carried a piece of rich red meat thrust through by an ashen stake. Presently they stopped. Go on, screamed the old woman. Catskin grumbled, and they came on searching the thicket with sun-dazzled eyes. Here, said Sis, and they took the ashen stake with the meat upon it and thrust it into the ground. Ooya, cried Sis, behold thy portion. And Uglomi we have slain. Of a truth 
we have slain Uglomi. This day we slew Uglomi, and tomorrow we will bring his body to you. And the others repeated the words. They looked at each other and behind them, and partly turned and began going back. At first they walked half-turned to the thicket. Then facing the mound, they walked faster, looking over their shoulders. Then faster. Soon they ran. It was a race at last, until they were near the knoll. Then Sis, who was hindmost, was first to slacken his pace. The sunset passed and the twilight came. The fires glowed red against the hazy blue of the distant chestnut trees, and the voices over the mound were merry. Eudina lay scarcely stirring, looking from the mound to the meat and then to the mound. She was hungry, she was afraid. At last she crept back to Uglomi. He looked round at the little rustle of her approach. His face was in shadow. Have you got me some food? he said. She said she could find nothing, but that she would seek further, and went back along the lion's path until she could see the mound again but she could not bring herself to take the meat. She had the brute's instinct of a snare. She felt very miserable. She crept back at last towards Uglomi and heard him stirring and moaning. She turned back to the mound again. Then she saw something in the darkness near the stake and peering distinguished a jackal. In a flash she was brave and angry. She sprang up cried out and ran towards the offering. She stumbled and fell and heard the growling of the jackal going off. When she arose, only the ashen stake lay on the ground. The meat was gone. So she went back to fast through the night with Uglomi. And Uglomi was angry with her because she had no food for him. But she told him nothing of the things she had seen. Two days passed and they were near starving when the tribe slew a horse. Then came the same ceremony and a haunch was left on the ashen stake, but this time Eudina did not hesitate. By acting and words she made Uglomi understand, but he ate most of the food before he understood. And then, as her meaning passed to him, he grew merry with his food. I am Ouya, he said. I am the lion. I am the great cave bear. I, who was only Uglomi. I am Wow the cunning. It is well that they should feed me, for presently I will kill them all. Then Udina's heart was light, and she laughed with him, and afterwards she ate what he had left of the horse flesh with gladness. After that it was, he had a dream, and the next day he made Udina bring him the lion's teeth and claws, so much of them as she could find, and hack him a club of alder, and he put the teeth and claws very cunningly into the wood so that the points were outward. Very long it took him, and he blunted two of his teeth hammering them in, and was very angry and threw the thing away but afterwards he dragged himself to where he had thrown it and finished it, a club of a new sort set with teeth. That day there was more meat for both of them, an offering to the lion from the tribe. It was one day, more than a hand's fingers of days, more than anyone had skill to count, after Uglomi had made the club, that Udina, while he was asleep, was lying in the thicket watching the squatting place. There had been no meat for three days, and the old woman came and worshipped after her manner. Now, while she worshipped, Udina's little friend C, and another, the child of the first girl Sis had loved, came over the knoll and stood regarding her skinny figure, and presently they began to mock her. Udina found this entertaining, 
But suddenly the old woman turned on them quickly and saw them. For a moment she stood, and they stood motionless, and then with a shriek of rage she rushed towards them, and all three disappeared over the crest of the knoll. Presently the children reappeared among the ferns beyond the shoulder of the hill. Little C ran first, for she was an active girl, and the other child ran squealing with the old woman close upon her. And over the knoll came Sis with a bone in his hand, and bow and catskin obsequiously behind him, each holding a piece of food. And they laughed aloud and shouted to see the old woman so angry, and with a shriek the child was caught, and the old woman set to work slapping, and the child screaming, and it was very good after dinner fun for them. Little C ran on a little way, and stopped at last between fear and curiosity. And suddenly came the mother of the child, with hair streaming, panting, and with a stone in her hand, and the old woman turned about like a wild cat. She was the equal of any woman, was the chief of the fireminders, in spite of her years, but before she could do anything, Sis shouted to her, and the clamour rose loud. Other shock heads came into sight. It seemed the whole tribe was at home and feasting, but the old woman dared not go on wreaking herself on the child Sis befriended. Everyone made noises and called names, even little C. Abruptly the old woman let go of the child she had caught and made a swift run at C, for C had no friends and C, realising her danger, when it was almost upon her, made off headlong with a faint cry of terror, not heeding whither she ran, straight to the lair of the lion. She swerved aside into the reeds presently, realising now whither she went. But the old woman was a wonderful old woman, as active as she was spiteful, and she caught C by the streaming hair within thirty yards of Udina. All the tribe now was running down the knoll, and shouting and laughing, ready to see the fun. Then something stirred in Udina, something that had never stirred in her before, and, thinking all of little C and nothing of her fear, she sprang up from her ambush and ran swiftly forward. The old woman did not see her, for she was busy beating little C's face with her hand beating with all her heart, and suddenly something hard and heavy struck her cheek. She went reeling and saw Udina with flaming eyes and cheeks between her and little C. She shrieked with astonishment and terror, and little C, not understanding, set off towards the gaping tribe. They were quite close now, for the sight of Udina had driven their fading fear of the lion out of their heads. In a moment, Udina had turned from the cowering old woman and overtaken C. See, she cried, see. She caught the child up in her arms as it stopped, pressed the nail-lined face into hers, and turned about to run towards her lair, the lair of the old lion. The old woman stood waist-high in the reeds and screamed foul things and inarticulate rage, but did not dare to intercept her, and at the bend of the path Eudina looked back and saw all the men of the tribe crying to one another and Sis coming at a trot along the lion's trail. She ran straight along the narrow way through the reeds to the shady place where Uglomi sat with his healing thigh just awakened by the shouting and rubbing his eyes. She came to him, a woman with little C in her arms. Her heart throbbed in her throat. Uglomi, she cried. Uglomi, the tribe comes. Uglomi sat staring in stupid astonishment at her and C. She pointed with C in one arm. She sought among her feeble store of words to explain. She could hear the men calling. Apparently they had stopped outside. 
She put down C and caught up the new club with the lion's teeth and put it into Uglomi's hand and ran three yards and picked up the first axe. Ah, said Uglomi, waving the new club, and suddenly he perceived the occasion and rolling over began to struggle to his feet. He stood but clumsily. He supported himself by one hand against the tree and just touched the ground gingerly with the toe of his wounded leg. In the other hand, he gripped the new club. He looked at his healing thigh and suddenly the reeds began whispering and ceased and whispered again and coming cautiously along the track, bending down and holding his fire-hardened stabbing stick of ash in his hand, appeared Sis. He stopped dead, and his eyes met Uglomi's. Uglomi forgot he had a wounded leg. He stood firmly on both feet. Something trickled. He glanced down and saw a little gout of blood had oozed out along the edge of the healing wound. He rubbed his hand there to give him the grip of his club and fixed his eyes again on Sis. Wow! he cried and sprang forward and Sis, still stooping and watchful, drove his stabbing stick up very quickly in an ugly thrust. It ripped to Glomi's guarding arm and the club came down in a counter that Sis was never to understand. He fell as an ox falls to the pole-axe at Uglomi's feet. To Bo it seemed the strangest thing. He had a comforting sense of tall reeds on either side, and an impregnable rampart, cis between him and any danger. Snail Eater was close behind, and there was no danger there. He was prepared to shove behind and send Sis to death or victory. That was his place as second man. He saw the butt of the spear Sis carried leap away from him, and suddenly a dull whack and the broad back fell away forward, and he looked Uglomi in the face over his prostrate leader. It felt to Bo as if his heart had fallen down as well. He had a throwing stone in one hand and an ashen stabbing stick in the other. He did not live to the end of his momentary hesitation which to use. Snail Eater was a readier man, and besides, Bo did not fall forward as Sis had done, but gave at his knees and hips, crumpling up with the toothed club upon his head. The Snail Eater drove his spear forward, swift and straight, and took Uglomi in the muscle of his shoulder and then he drove him hard with the smiting stone in his other hand, shouting out as he did so. The new club swished ineffectually through the reeds. Udina saw Uglomi come staggering back from the narrow path into the open space, tripping over Sis, and with a foot of ashen stake sticking out of him over his arm. And then the snail-eater, whose name she had given, had his final injury from her. As his exultant face came out of the reeds after his spear, for she swung the first axe swift and high, and hit him fair and square on the temple, and down he went on Sis at prostrate Uglomi's feet. But before Uglomi could get up, the two red-haired men were tumbling out of the reeds, spears and smiting stones ready, and snake hard upon them. One she struck on the neck, but not to fell him, and he blundered aside and spoilt his brother's blow at Uglomi's head. In a moment Uglomi dropped his club and had his assailant by the waist, and had pitched him sideways, sprawling. He snatched at his club again and recovered it. The man Udina had hit stabbed at her with his spear as he stumbled from her blow, and involuntary she gave ground to avoid him. He hesitated between her and Uglomi. Uglomi half turned, gave a vague cry at finding Uglomi so near, and in a moment Uglomi had him by the throat, and the club had his third victim, 
As he went down, Uglomi shouted. No wounds, but an exultant cry. The other red-haired man was six feet from her, with his back to her, and a darker red streaking his head. He was struggling to his feet. She had an irrational impulse to stop his rising. She flung the axe at him, missed, saw his face in profile, and he had swerved beyond Little C, and was running through the reeds. She had a transitory vision of Snake standing in the throat of the path, half turned away from her, and then she saw his back. She saw the club whirling through the air, and the shock head of Uglomi, with blood in the hair and blood upon the shoulder, vanishing below the reeds in pursuit. Then she heard Snake scream like a woman. She ran past C to where the handle of the axe stuck out of a clump of fern, and turning, found herself panting and alone with three motionless bodies. The air was full of shouts and screams. For a space she was sick and giddy, and then it came to her head that Uglomi was being killed along the reed path and with an inarticulate cry she leapt over the body of Bo and hurried after him. Snake's feet lay across the path, and his head was among the reeds. She followed the path until it bent around and opened out by the alders, and thence she saw all that was left of the tribe in the open, scattering like dead leaves before a gale, and going back over the knoll. Uglomi was hard upon Catskin. But Catskin was fleet of foot and got away, and so did young Wow How when Uglomi turned upon him. And Uglomi pursued Wow How far beyond the knoll before he desisted. He had the rage of battle on him now, and the wood thrust through his shoulder stung him like a spur. When she saw he was in no danger, she stopped running and stood panting, watching the distant active figures run up and vanish one by one over the knoll. In a little time she was alone again. Everything had happened very swiftly. The smoke of Brother Fire rose straight and steady from the squatting place, just as it had done ten minutes ago when the old woman had stood yonder worshipping the lion. And after a long time, as it seemed, Uglomi reappeared over the knoll, and came back to Udina, triumphant and breathing heavily. She stood, her hair about her eyes and hot-faced, with the blood-stained axe in her hand, at the place where the tribe had offered her as a sacrifice to the lion. Oh! cried Uglomi at the sight of her his face alight with the fellowship of battle, and he waved his new club, red now and hairy, and at the sight of his glowing face her tense pose relaxed somewhat, and she stood sobbing and rejoicing. Uglomi had a queer, unaccountable pang at the sight of her tears, but he only shouted, Wow! the louder, and shook the axe east and west. He called manfully to her to follow him and turned back, striding with the club swinging in his hand towards the squatting place, as if he had never left the tribe, and she ceased her weeping and followed quickly as a woman should. So Uglomi and Udina came back to the squatting place from which they had fled many days before from the face of Uya and by the squatting place lay a deer half-eaten, just as there had been before Uglomi was man or Udina woman. So Uglomi sat down to eat, and Udina beside him like a man, and the rest of the tribe watched them from safe hiding places. And after a time, one of the elder girls came back timorously, carrying little C in her arms and Una called to them by name, and offered them food. But the elder girl was afraid and would not come. 
though C struggled to come to Udina. Afterwards, when Uglomi had eaten, he sat dozing, and at last he slept, and slowly the others came out of the hiding places and drew near. And when Uglomi woke, save that there were no men to be seen, it seemed as though he had never left the tribe. Now there is a thing strange but true, that all through this fight Uglomi forgot that he was lame, and was not lame. And after he had rested, behold, he was a lame man, and he remained a lame man to the end of his days. Catskin and a second red-haired man, and Wauhau, who chipped flints cunningly as his father had done before him, fled from the face of Uglomi, and none knew where they hid. But two days after they came and squatted a good way off from the knoll among the bracken, under the chestnuts, and watched, Uglomi's rage had gone. He moved to go against them, and did not, and at sundown they went away. That day too they found the old woman among the ferns where Uglomi had blundered upon her when she had pursued Wauhau. She was dead, and more ugly than ever, but ho! The jackals and vultures had tried her and left her. She was ever a wonderful old woman. The next day the three men came again and squatted nearer, and Wauhau had two rabbits to hold up, and the red-haired man a wood pigeon, and Uglomi stood before the women and mocked them. The next day they sat again nearer, without stones or sticks, and with the same offerings, and Catskin had a trout. It was rare men caught a fish in those days, but Catskin would stand silently in the water for hours and catch them with his hand. And the fourth day Uglomi suffered these three to come to the squatting place in peace, with the food they had with them. Uglomi ate the trout. Thereafter, for many moons, Uglomi was master and had his will in peace. And on the fullness of time, he was killed and eaten, even as Uya had been slain.